Um, thank you all for turning out tonight on a Monday night right at the dinner hour. We appreciate that. Um, when we put this lecture series together, the whole curiosity was why is there always that image when Hollywood wants to give us a general? He always has a cigar and he always has a southern accent. Okay? And what we were trying to figure out was why is that and where does this come from? So, what my role is within the whole series is to talk about how historians have debated this whole issue of a Southern military tradition. Um, there is one, there isn't one, how this fight goes back and forth, and then tie in my own theories on how the Civil War fits within this. Okay? And so that's what we're really here to look at today. Basically, what it comes down to are these four key issues okay, that really shape how the fight has been carried out, particularly over the last several decades, and where it fits within the memory of the Confederate war effort, the memory of the Civil War. Okay? And don't worry, I only have two slides. I hate a lot of slides. <laughs> all right, that's why we were laughing when the PowerPoint wouldn't work. It's like, it's all right, there's only two anyway. Um, you know, in the years immediately following the Civil War, most white Southerners resisted and resented Union occupation. Southerners resented being forced to accept Northern le legislation, like the 13th Amendment that ended slavery, as well as the 14th and 15th Amendments. They recoiled when Northerners faulted them for the Black Codes, responding sharply that similar racial divisions existed in the North. Looking at criticisms of Mississippi in particular, the Chicago Tribune outraged to hear the severity of Black Codes in Mississippi that severely restricted the rights of freedmen, warned, quote, we tell the white men of Mississippi that the men of the North will convert the state of Mississippi into a frog pond before they will allow such laws to disgrace one foot of the soil in which the bones of our soldiers sleep and over which the flag of freedom waves. The trouble, though, as white Mississippians were more than happy to point out, was that in Chicago and places throughout the North, blacks were excluded from juries, forbidden from interracial marriage, suffered under racially discriminatory law enforcement, suffered under segregated by law or by choice school systems, and even kept from testifying against whites. So the heated exchanges that you see in the post-war <coughs> period were reminiscent of the antebellum period, except for the fact that now Southerners knew they lacked the strength to physically resist Northern demands. Instead, slowly they learned to adapt to certain expectations of the federal government while quietly reinstating their, so their old class, racial, and gender divisions. And this was in part possible because similar divisions existed in the North, and in part because, as Reconstruction dragged on, Northerners' willingness to maintain the cost of a lengthy occupation dwindled. They also lacked interest in pushing beyond that profound yet basic step of emancipation to reach the point of true racial equality. Now, as this took place, many Southern whites, who had played influential, influential roles in the antebellum period, resumed their positions of authority. Slavery may not have existed anymore, but gradually, through Reconstruction and on through the late 19th century, Southern whites recreated much of the old social order. One of the ways they did this was by emphasizing their distinctiveness from the North by returning to a pre-war story of Southern military prowess. This also worked to defend Southern manhood, in the face of Confederate defeat. Now, part of this is tied to the Lost Cause, which argued that if Confederate boys failed to win in the late unpleasantness, it was not due to any fault of their own. They were simply overwhelmed by an industrial North. The Union victory, according to the Lost Cause, held no glory, no honors, no heroes. That became the Southern story, and it quickly intertwined with a Southern white military tradition of virtuous citizens making the ultimate sacrifice for the nation. Even in the face of almost certain defeat, so the story went, Southern boys, Southern women, the entire white South sacrificed themselves and all they had for what they knew was right. The lost cause created the picture of the ultimate revolutionary virtuous citizens. Because again, if you remember the argument of the social contract and virtuous citizens, it's that citizens not only have the right but the obligation to rebel when that social contract is violated, right? So if you're rebelling in the face of what you know is almost certain defeat, it makes the sacrifice all the more worthy. If difficult, but all the more wor worthy. Now, what we want to look at today is how the idea of a Southern military tradition became an important part of the lost cause. And the idea of a Southern military tradition, or a Southern way of war, if you will, dates back to the early Republic. Virginia, remember, 
Washington, Virginia George Washington, was the guy who led the American forces to victory during the, Ameri during the Revolutionary War. William Henry Harrison became the hero of Tippecanoe. And while he did this as the territorial governor of Indiana, he was born and raised among the planter class of Virginia. The War of 1812 provided heroes in the form of Tennessean Andrew Jackson, while the Texas Revolution made heroes of Tennesseans Davy Crockett and Sam Houston, as well as South Carolinian William Barrett Travis and Kentuckian slash Louisiana Jim Bowie. Similarly, the Mexican War highlighted the services of, of Virginians Winfield Scott and Zachary Taylor. The trouble with this list, though, and within American memory, is that it ignores northern military heroes that were known at the time, such as Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys from, of all places, that wonderful militaristic society of Vermont. <laughs> and it overlooks the logistical genius of Henry Knox, who managed to move the 55 guns from Fort Ticonderoga that Ethan Allen and the boys captured, <laughs> moves these guns 300 miles using oxen and horses in the winter, in which, you know, is conjuring up uphills both ways in a blizzard. And it, it ignores the feats of Oliver Hazard Perry, of Matthew Perry, in the War of 1812. But what Americans seem to remember was that it was New Englanders who had never really supported the War of 1812, that had threatened at least a few of them to consider secession, and that it was Northeasterners who failed to fully back the Mexican War. That became the popular memory. They became the pasty-faced mechanics, while Southern boys continued to live rural lives filled with the masculine traditions of hunting and shooting and dueling. So historians and buffs alike have tackled this question of, how did this happen? How did this whole image come about? Northerners in particular, who are very frustrated with this image of themselves as the pasty-faced mechanics. <laughs> right, nobody wants to be the pasty-faced mechanic. All right? Marcus, Marcus Kuhnlefe was one of the first, a really, a, a really talented, influential historian, to battle and really struggle with this idea and this issue. And in 1968, he published, it's one of my favorite books, Soldiers and Civilians, The Martial Spirit of America, in which he argued several key points. These include the idea that it was true that the old militia system was declining in the antebellum north, but he pointed out that it was also declining in the antebellum south. Kuhnliffe also challenged the idea that the south had more military schools, offering dozens of northern versions of Norwich to counter a dozen southern versions of the Citadel. Similarly, he argued that the only inst inst insistence excuse me, of the popularity of romantic heroes in the south, personified by southerns and southerners' infatuation with Sir Walter Scott novels, was matched in the North, where Scott was just as popular. And perhaps the most often cited challenge by Kuhnlef was his argument that Northerners, not Southerners, dominated West Point, as well as the old army, the U.S. Army before the American Civil War. Kuhnlef found that approximately 60%, 60 percent, 60 percent of West Point alums and regular army officers were from the North, and only 40 percent were from the South. Similarly, Kuhnliffe detailed the number of northern cities with military companies, arguing that, that they were just as popular in the north as in the south. The other most respected challenge to the idea of a unique antebellum southern military tradition came from the renowned military historian Donald Higginbotham. Higginbotham appa appalled a lot of readers when he demonstrated, and I can't believe Kyle Zellner is sick tonight, because he would love this, Higginbotham demonstrated that New Englanders actually had a stronger and more respected military tradition during the American Revolution than Southerners did. Higginbotham, in his 1991 presidential address to the Southern Historical Association, noted that much of the, quote, Southern way of war, quote, argument is grounded in the idea that, quote, slavery and fears of black uprisings contributed to a martial spirit in the South. This was certainly the crux of John Hope Franklin's The Militant South, published in 1956 where Franklin highlighted a South where rural and even frontier conditions, combined with white fears of slave uprisings, concept of honor and manhood, and increasing defensiveness against the North, can create a uniquely militant South. But Higginbotham notes that if this begins and is sustained, at least in part, by constant fear of uprisings, colonial and revolutionary New England certainly shared that experience. As Higginbotham notes to New Englanders, quote, Native Americans, too, were heathens of an inferior race and culture, quote. And he underscores that, quote, unlike blacks in the South, Indians were not enslaved. They soon acquired muskets and used them lethally in King Philip's War and onward throughout the colonial period. Similarly, Higginbotham argues, throughout the colonial period, New Englanders celebrated their martial tradition in song, poetry, and literature. While Southerners may have had some of these interests, they lacked an outside reputation for a warrior tradition. American General Charles Lee, 
British General Thomas Gage, as well as the Ministry in London, for example, believed that northern colonies, not southern, were more warlike. Higginbotham also noted that while the Virginian George Washington is a hero of the war, quote, the South was actually rescued by Yankee generals Nathaniel Greene and Anthony Wayne. Now, the shot back came from Civil War historian James McPherson, who took the opposite position, insisting that there was something very different about the two regions on the eve of the American Civil War. McPherson attacked Cunliffe's arguments and his evidence, arguing that while Cunliffe offered examples of the popularity of northern military companies, he failed to offer a statistical comparison. And this is actually a weak part of McPherson's argument because he doesn't offer any statistical comparisons on that point either. He just says, he basically says, if he had offered this, it probably would have supported the traditional view of a higher concentration of such companies in the South. He then quips, quote, what northern city, for example, would compare with Charleston? which had no fewer than 22 military companies in the late 1850s, one for every 200 white men of military age. Which is, that's, that's, that's a lot of military companies, absolutely. The problem with this argument is, number one, Charleston is not the South in the 1850s. The other problem is what exactly these military companies do, okay? And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. McPherson was on much stronger ground when he noted that while Northerners did comprise 60% of West Point alumni and regular officers to the South's 40%, remember, he's, he's admitting Cunliffe's stats. He says Cunliffe have misrepresented the numbers, though. The South comprised 30% of the American white population in the antebellum period. That means that they were statistically overrepresented in those West Point categories. Okay? And McPherson went on to note that, quote, from 1841 to 1861, all of the secretaries of war were Southerners as were the General-in-Chief of the Army, two of the three Brigadier Generals, all but one commander of the Army's geographical departments on the eve of the Civil War, the authors of the two manuals on infantry tactics and of the artillery manual used at West Point, and the professor who taught tactics and strategy at the Military Academy. He shows that, I know, the numbers are fabulous. He shows that more than three-fifths of Mexican War volunteers came from slave states quote, on a per capita basis, four times the proportion of free state volunteers. Not including West Point or Annapolis, the 1860 census, McPherson argued, revealed seven of the eight military colleges in the slave states. And at this point, this is great, I mean, McPherson is on a roll. As he goes on, the antebellum men listed in the Dictionary of American Biography, there were twice as many Southerners as Northerners listed as, as a military profession. Northerners, he found, were far more likely to classify themselves as men of literature, art, medicine, education, engineers, and inventors. And this, by the way, when my students read this, is where they always get frustrated. They're calling us stupid. All right, he's calling us stupid. All right, this is one they hate McPherson for a little while. In one of my favorite lines of anything McPherson has ever written, and he is a wonderful writer, he quips, when Southerners labeled themselves a nation of warriors and Yankees a nation of shopkeepers, a general comparison in 1860, or when Jefferson Davis told a London Times correspondent in 1861 that, quote, we are a military people, they were not just whistling Dixie. <laughs> but there's problems, okay? Because historians being historians, we have a hit that's going to come right back. And we have several hits that shoot back at McPherson's arguments. In the forms of Matt Kaufman, Don Higginbotham again, James Morrison, they all challenge McPherson's arguments. Morrison, in his history of West Point, the antebellum period, found that the South was not overrepresented. If again, this is where you get there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. The South, he says, was not overrepresented among the faculty and staff. Southerners comprised more than one third of the employees in only three departments. Just under 15% of all West Point educated officers joined the Confederacy. In fact, as Don Higginbotham has noted, if we really want to have fun with the numbers, we need to recognize that 23 of the first 100 West Point graduates were Vermonters including Alden Partridge, Partridge, who founded Norwich and who influenced the founding of military schools throughout the United States, which again is marvelously getting back into the Vermont way of war. As for the other stats, Morrison argues that, quote, it is true that in comparison with the total white male population between 15 and 20 years of age, 4.7% more cadets were admitted from the future Confederate states than their proportion of the total population warranted. But, this is the embarrassing part. This was because more Southern students failed academically or were dismissed for misconduct. 
necessitating additional appointments to fill the vacancies which resulted from their departures. He says, with respect to graduates, okay, not, admit, not admitted students, just to graduates, the data reveal that a grand total of seven more Southerners, 0.5%, graduated than the population of that region merited. And this underscores two points. Being comfortable with weapons, embracing and demonstrating concepts of honor, and being inherently violent does not make one a natural soldier. And I'm not saying the Southerners are inherently violent, but if you want to go with that argument, that's not a sign of a disciplined, a naturally disciplined person who's going to make a great soldier. And the battle of numbers also is a battle of numbers, okay? They can, be, they can all be manipulated. Now, there are other problems too. In his social history entitled The Old Army, Matt Kaufman found that military service increased ties between regions as men and their families served together on frontier posts and as officers and men fought together on western campaigns or during the Mexican War. Similarly, Higginbotham, Morrison, Kunlefa, and Kaufman all found that Southerners were more interested in education and economic opportunities than military, that military schools could provide their young men, as well as the financial benefits of having trained citizens who could inexpensively run and maintain their arsenals rather than paying individuals for this service. More recently, Jennifer Green reached a similar conclusion in her study, Military Education and the Emerging Middle Class in the Old South. And there's another recent book that looks at West Point graduates during the 19th Army that is arguing the same thing, a fairly even regional split. Indeed, antebellum white Southerners in classic anti-federalist tradition were generally suspicious of a standing army and any significant military presence, state or federal, in their communities. Yes, they wanted men capable of performing slave patrols and providing basic security. Again, though, large numbers of militia companies and men familiar with firearms does not indicate an innate talent nor the discipline necessary for 19th century combat. In March 1860, James J. Pettigrew described those numerous Charleston companies that James McPherson pointed to. He said, Pettigrew described them, a contemporary, as far more elitist and like social clubs than any professional military organization. Nor did they provide the kind of training and discipline that would have made them particularly useful when the war began. Indeed, Pettigrew warned that Charleston's organized militias were, in 1860, almost defunct. Also, returning to the anti-federalist roots of many Southern Democrats, Pettigrew argued, quote, a standing army is out of the question, he's referring to the Southern states, the traditions of our country condemn such an idea as treason against the first principles of a free government. What he and other leading Southern whites wanted was to professionalize the militias, which he described as defective and inapplicable to changing necessities. And he argued that South Carolina wasn't the only Southern state with these problems. Pettigrew reminded his readers that when John Brown led his raid on Harper's Ferry the previous year, Virginians had had to call in federal Marines because Virginia lacked dependable state militias. Now, it's true that during the Civil War, famous Southern units like the Texas Brigade, the Stonewall Brigade, Williams Bar William Barksdale's Mississippians, emerged to reinforce the idea of a natural military prowess among Southern men. But the North produced some incredible units too. The Iron Brigade, composed of regiments from Wisconsin, Indiana, and Michigan, as well as Verdan's famous unit of sharpshooters from Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and before we start to argue, okay, it's a Western and Southern thing, the 1st and 2nd regiments of U.S. sharpshooters also included men from New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Maine, and, you guessed it, Vermont. So, we have a little bit of a problem. What do we do with the question of the Old South, the Civil War, and how the 19th century influenced the idea of a Southern military tradition? Clearly, there were elite units from the North as well as the South, from the East and the West. But the answer to the idea of a southern way of war may be found in asking a slightly different question. Why did southerners embrace this concept? In other words, it's not so much, reaching out to my cultural historian friends, it's not so much whether or not it's true, it's whether or not people insist or think that it's true. When southerners sent their young men to military academies in the antebellum and in the post-war period, for example, they were acknowledging the role these schools played in the maintenance of law and order in the creation of virtuous citizens. As Rod Andrew explains in his history of the Southern military school tradition, his great book called Long Gray Lines, military education did not reflect a Southern proclivity for violence, but rather an interest in law and order and Republican, and we're talking small art here, values. Okay? Americans North and South saw the safety of the Republic 
as dependent upon a well-trained and law-abiding citizenry. And they turned to military schools to help provide this. So when you see the large number of military schools, what Andrew's arguing, I think he's right, is it's not that Southerners love the military because they're inherently violent. It's actually Southerners love, like the idea of the discipline and concepts of basic military um, citizenry, that link between being a good citizen and service to the nation. That is what he's arguing you see. Andrew found that Southerners embraced the practice of military schools teaching young men, quote, submission to lawful authority. They also offered economic opportunity for poor Southern whites, who were judged as having promise by leading members of their community, and thus served as an egalitarian purpose. In the post-war period, these schools were used to rebuild the South. They were also key to creating a concept of a Southern military tradition, but not so much as a warrior class, Again, the kind of attack and die school of the Southerners are inherently violent, and that's why they're better on the attack. That was pretty well killed right before we went on spring break. But rather the idea as a, of a white South that was stable, disciplined, and in control. This was particularly attractive during a period when there was such social and racial turmoil. Indeed, these military schools were seen by post-war Southern whites as a way to give military training to a citizenry to protect them from encroachments by the federal government though not necessarily in terms of armed rebellion. What's fascinating is that as they did this, they still looked to the war, the Civil War, to invoke romantic images of the Old South, of the talents of Southern warriors. Even as VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, for example, changed its focus from military preparedness to education and discipline, it still highlighted the fight of the cadets at Newmarket, of their graduates' role in the war, including Stonewall Jackson, and the legend of the lost cause, excuse me, Jackson was former faculty, and the legend of the lost cause. And by the way, that's, that painting is the very famous painting of the VMI cadets at Newmarket, which is in the chapel at VMI, which I absolutely love. So, the idea that's in the chapel, just perfect. <laughs> to clarify, okay, again, to make sure we understand the idea of the lost cause, this involved how Southern whites remembered and interpreted Confederate defeat. It really didn't start to thrive until the 1880s, when veterans North and South, for reasons that we still debate, began to discuss their military service and insist that others remember the war, and they wanted to have a role in shaping how that memory was constructed. It was at this time that publications like the Confederate Veteran and the Southern Historical Society papers became increasingly popular venues in which veterans shaped that memory and debated that memory, sometimes fiercely, with each other. Within the South, the fight was shaped as a lost cause, a noble crusade that Southern whites could not have won, but that was made all the more glorious because knowing this, Southern men still insisted on defending what they knew was right and resisting what they knew was wrong. The Citadel's fight to reopen, the Civil, reopen after the Civil War is another great example of this. Their pitch focused on Confederate heroes among their alumni, but emphasized the importance of post-war education in creating good citizens among Southern white men. These graduates, wrapped in the glory of the Lost Cause, would rebuild the Old South in the New South. The Lost Cause within this discussion was not about training Southern white men for another war, or even really to defend the state. It was about a sense of honor, of valor, and of civic duty. And it was open for white men, mostly Southern white men. Interestingly enough, in the post-war North, an idea evolved that military schools was antithetical to the American Republican tradition. Northerners were starting to abandon their desire for military schools. In the South, however, they remained, wrapped in the glory of the lost cause, and they were seen as central to a young man's duty to his community, to his region. Okay? Now again, though, I don't want to get this militaristic image that seems to creep into the debate. It's not that they were without rebellions or complaints, but Southern men, when these events took place, were defending notions of honor, loyalty, and integrity. You get a fascinating dichotomy here. Quote, even as the soldier in Southern society stood for discipline, law, and order, he also symbolized defiance and manly resistance to authority. This is Rod Andrew arguing. He goes on to point out that the Southern military tradition did not mimic militaristic notions of de deference and obedience. By upholding authority, it also incorporated the Republican idea that for the health of society and the honor of its citizens, the latter must sometimes resist authority as well, which is actually a fairly reminiscent of a secessionist debate. That's, that is the social contract. But there's a whole group that we haven't talked about yet tonight. And the question is, what about Southern freedmen during all of this? 
Much of the social stability and discipline that we're referring to here in the post-war period was at that time in reference to returning social order, pre-war social and racial order, to the New South. As Southern whites argued that, quote, soldiership, quote, was associated with good citizenship, they ran into a challenge. If former slaves were citizens now, as clarified by the 14th and 15th Amendments, should not they also attend these schools? Indeed, they, if anyone, needed assistance in learning the responsibilities of citizenship and the education to make informed, contributing decisions. But most whites, North and South, did not warm to this argument. Southern black leaders, and some whites, however, argued that military schools sh could be marvelous tools to challenge racial stereotypes of the slothful and licentious black man. A major problem, however, was that there was no historic tradition of Southern black military schools. And that historic tradition had been what was, had created, basically, the reopening of BMI, the reopening of the Citadel, and the continued tradition within the post-war South. The African-American community did not have this, this antebellum tradition to cite, and there was a long tradition of keeping weapons out of the hands of blacks. When Southern whites did run into armed, disciplined groups of blacks, it rarely ended well. There's a fascinating story I came across a couple months ago while I was doing some research up at Baylor, and it relates to my book on the Texas Brigade. In 1908, there was a guy by the name of John Henderson who was uh, studying law when the Civil War began, went off and joined the Texas Brigade, became an officer, went back home to Waco, Texas after the war, and became a practicing lawyer. His friend in 1908 was asked to write down some of his memories of Judge Henderson. Um, it was a very prominent Texan, prominent white southerner who was known for maintaining law and order, carrying out justice, had a you know, long-term reputation for not accepting bribes, these types of things. And his friend wrote down a number of stories. One involved a situation in 1867, two years after the war ended, and was all about Judge Henderson's wonderful influence on law and order. Now, to be clear, the author, John Perry, portrays Henderson, he's an elite white, playing a classically paternalistic role during Reconstruction, just as the Henderson family had done during the antebellum period. In 1867, Perry related, the Negroes of Brazos County, and this is a quote, would meet in Milliken every Saturday and drill the military company they had organized there. They had a regular organized battalion with their officers in uniform. They had become very independent and almost unbearable. And one day, while in Bryan, I received a telegram from Doc Hardy of Milliken stating that the Negroes were in arms and were going to attack the whites and to come down on the next train and bring every man who could get a gun. As every man there was an old soldier, by the time the train could be made up, we had 300 about armed men at the depot ready to get aboard. We got to Milliken just at dark. The white people were forded up in the depot, and they told us that a few minutes before they had seen the Negroes in line in a battle in Freedmantown, about 400 yards from the depot. As soon as we got off the train, we formed in line of battle, threw out skirmishers, and started for Freedmantown. But when we got there, we could not find man, woman, or child, or even a dog in the town. We put pickets out on all the roads leading into town and waited until daylight. The next day, all that could procure horses rode through the county and killed all the Negroes not at work in the fields. Their colonel was hung in Peachtree Creek Bottom, and from 50 to 100 were shot in the woods. John Henderson and I did not get horses, and we went back to Bryan the next morning. Now, the author, author clarifies that Henderson was actually not involved in any of the killing. And he does hold him up, though, as one of the great veterans of the Lost Cause, still sacrificing his own wants and needs for the discipline and order of post-war Texas society. And he clarifies that, quote, the Negroes never drilled again in Brazos County up to this day that I have ever heard of, or anywhere else in Texas. Now, in several cases, African American communities did find success opening black military schools. Not as militias or for purposes of defense, but as schools that men still young black men with discipline, obedience, and the basic skills of good citizenship. This is how they were sold. Even so, however, the cadets were almost always trained by white faculty and almost never allowed to drill with weapons. The situation remained this way into the 20th century primarily because the Southern military tradition in the 19th century had been so closely intertwined with the memory of two things. Number one, the Lost Cause, which in part rejected that slavery had anything to do with the war, and number two, about creating an organized, disciplined, virtuous white citizenry that would reorder the New South as a 
reflection of the racially structured Old South. And as long as those two, those two concepts remain key to the post-war Southern military tradition, it would remain a theme grounded in the memory of the Lost Cause, Confederate heroes, and the Old South. The ultimate challenge to that would be as forces began to defy that image, including through the arming of African American men for America's future wars. And that is what we'll hear about next Monday from David Silver. Thank you. One and all.